So we will be talking in bioelectromagnetics, lecture number four, basic concepts in biology. And uh, last time we uh, did some basic concepts in electromagnetism, actually two lectures about that following the overview in history. And today we'll be focusing on some very basic concepts in biology. For those of you with a biology background, this will be quite uh, simple and review. For those of you with more physical sciences background, uh, this may be a little bit more new material. But as I mentioned, uh, just like the uh, electromagnetism that we did earlier, it's very important to uh, also have a common vocabulary, a common understanding in biology as we bring those uh, together. So we had asked the question, uh, what is life? And many of you had given some very good answers and we'll explore this issue in the uh, uh, lecture. But essentially life is uh, complex uh, organizations that are able to independently reproduce. Uh, and that's very important. And in fact, this question, what is life, is very critical to uh, what's going on now with the COVID-19 situation and the virus in particular. Uh, viruses are actually not alive. Uh, they don't have an independent ability to reproduce on their own. They have to actually infect the host cell and use the host cell machinery in order to, uh, in order to uh, reproduce and replicate. So they are not independently living, which has a lot of very important implications. And one of these is the concept of antiviral medication. Uh, unlike some of the miracle drugs for bacteria like penicillin and antibiotics, which actually can kill bacteria, there is no such antiviral medicine that can kill viruses. You cannot, in effect, kill something that is not alive. The only thing antivirals do are slow it down. So when uh, President Moon actually yesterday announced a big initiative for vaccine research, uh, that's you know, very significant uh, because the, ultimately the uh, definitive solution to this problem will be a vaccine. And that's related to this concept, what it's like. So I'll do a very quick review from the previous lecture. Uh, we'll be discussing the Fourier transform time domain versus frequency domain, uh, spectroscopy, uh, basic concepts of conduction, convection, radiation, polarization, absorption, uh, and then very a quick overview of computational methods in electromagnetism. So the concept of the Fourier transform is uh, quite simple. It is that uh, any uh, waveform can be deconstructed as a sum of uh, trigonometric or sinusoidal waveforms. So every complex waveform can be a, uh, individually resolved into uh, a number of uh, wave components to that waveform. And uh, one example of this is actually in hearing, uh, how the ear hears. When we have sound around us, it's in multiple frequencies with uh, waves, obviously, and each frequency has a different wave associated with it. And all those frequencies come into the ear, hit the uh, tympanic membrane, the eardrum, and uh, different portions in the tympanic membrane will respond to different frequencies, and they will deconstruct that complex sound into the individual frequency. They do, in a sense, reverse Fourier transport. Uh, so Fourier transform basically says you can take any signal and decompose it in terms of sine waves, and you can use those sine waves to construct a, not that waveform back. And so when it comes to time domain electromagnetic fields and frequency domain electromagnetic fields, we have essentially uh, two ways to probe matter. We can either do time domain, which is a wide pulse of radiation that uh, has many frequencies in it. That's why we call it time domain. It's related to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle uh, where there's an inverse relationship between the uh, precision of the frequency and the precision of the time. If the time uh, is, is uh, very uh, broad, uh, the frequency is very specific. 
If the time is very short, a short pulse, then the frequency is very broad. So these are opposite concepts in spectroscopy. You can see that expressed here. Uh, time domain measurement will have many frequencies, uh, whereas a frequency domain measurement will have a single frequency. And we can go in between the two of them when we make uh, measurements. The basic concepts of conduction, convection, radiation, as illustrated in this diagram. Radiation is essentially uh, electromagnetic rays, w waves being emitted from an object, uh, especially in reference to heat. Uh, and the conduction and convection with respect to heat, which is related to molecular motion, is not the uh, spread by radiation, but rather by the direct uh, physical movement of these molecules. In the case of conduction, the physical movement uh, of one molecule with another. In the case of convection, those uh, moving molecules are transported in large scale uh, currents. Polarization is the concept of the uh, electromagnetic vector. Remember we said that uh, from the original electromagnetism that the magnetic field is perpendicular to the uh, electric field. So you have two uh, perpendicular uh, phenomena, the electromagnetic phenomena perpendicular. And then that, uh, plane of the wave, the sine wave is a transverse wave, can also be in 360 degrees. So we can have polarized light, unpolarized light, and circularly polarized light. The concept of energy absorption is related to three factors. How much of the radiation is absorbed by an object is related to the intrinsic absorption coefficient. Uh, that's the molar absorptivity. It's related to the concentration of that object. Uh, if it's a solution, for example, or if it's a, uh, uh, how much of that object, it, uh, how dense it is, in, if it is a proportion of a object, and then the length that that radiation goes through or the path length. Those three factors multiplied will give the absorption in a logarithmic uh, curve. And so you can describe this uh, visually with the power in, uh, and the sample with a certain length and the power out. And of course, there will be uh, radiation absorbed and uh, increased concentration, more absorption, increased path length, more absorption, and uh, increased molar absorptivity, uh, also increased absorption. And different substances will have different molar absorptivity for different frequencies. So this Beer-Lambert law is frequency or wavelength specific. So not only is it specific to the nature of the material, which is the epsilon here, but it's also specific to the nature of the radiation. For example, uh, in the body, uh, we have a pretty high absorption for visible light. Uh, we are not transparent. Visible light goes O molar absorptivity. For so x-rays uh, go, uh, uh, x-rays go through the body very easily. So when we do calculations on electromagnetism, uh, we'll see some examples later. Uh, we typically use uh, those Maxwell's equations. And uh, one of the most important ones, of course, is to describe the electric field around the charge distribution. And that's the first of Maxwell's equations. And that's essentially Gauss's law, uh, which states that the electric field flux around a surface, around a charge distribution, will be equal to the charge distribution divided by the, uh, a, a, a constant. That Gauss's law can be expressed in two forms, in an integral form, which takes the whole surface, and then also a differential form, which takes a little uh, element of the surface and, and uh, derives a law specific to that element. Uh, so we can have calculation methods in electromagnetism that are either differential equation solvers that look at this from the differential equation side, uh, and also another approach is from the integral equation side. And those are the two major approaches to computing. We either analyze things specifically in location or we look at the whole situation, differential or integral. So now let's uh, go to the topic for today, 
uh, some basic concepts in biology. We have quite a lot of slides, uh, so I'll go fairly quickly, but the point of this is to be a review. Uh, and again, some of you may already know this, and uh, for others, it, uh, some of it may be uh, old material or uh, uh, not uh, very uh, exposed to it that much. So we'll talk first about biochemistry, then we'll talk about cells and tissues, we'll talk about basic physiology. So three things, uh, basic concepts in biology. So in terms of biochemistry, we'll discuss basic molecules because a lot of the electromagnetic interactions with biology will occur at the level of molecules. So we need to understand what types of molecules are in biology. And uh, we'll discuss the fundamentals of organic chemistry and uh, biochemistry. And we'll talk about four types of uh, molecules, carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and nucleic acids. So carbohydrates look like this, fats uh, here, uh, proteins, and nucleic acids like DNA and RNA. So now let's talk a little bit about fundamentals. So in organic chemistry, uh, it's basically the chemistry of carbon, but we know that biochemistry, many biochemical molecules have carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. Those are the three major second row elements that are found in biochemical molecules. There are others as well. We talked about iron and calcium, for example, uh, absorbing x-rays, but the basic organic uh, molecules have carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. Now, these are not randomly, uh, obviously, constructed, and there are uh, uh, patterns of organization of these atoms, and we call these organic functional groups. Uh, and these functional groups uh, have a limited number, and we're going to go through each of them. So one of them, uh, important functional group, is the hydroxyl functional group, which has an alcohol. The other one is a carbonyl functional group, which is uh, a carbon with a double bonded oxygen with a hydrogen, or that carbonyl can be in the middle between two other carbons. We call this an aldehyde, the second one a, a ketone. Uh, we can have a little bit more complex form of this doubly bonded oxygen in what's called a carboxyl. A carboxyl is a carbon doubly bonded to an oxygen, singly bonded to a hydroxyl here, it's not a hydroxyl because it has an unusual behavior that it's acidic and you have a non-ionized and an ionized form for the hydroxyl. And this is an acid, organic acid. Then we also have the amino group, which is a nitrogen and uh, three bonds around the nitrogen and that can be typically hydrogen. That can be non-ionized or ionized. And this is an organic base. So these organic functional groups uh, give the possibility of something that is slightly polar, slightly reactive, acidic, basic, and sulfhydryl groups we see in proteins and phosphate groups, uh, which have a lot of negative charge we see in nucleic acids. Now, one reason why I highlight the phosphate group here is that it has these negative charges. And these negative charges represent the high energy sort of concentration of charge. And that uh, it becomes very important things like ATP and other uh, energetic transformations. So these molecules are very uh, complex. And of course, there are uh, thousands of them, hundreds of thousands of organic molecules, millions uh, potentially in various combinations. So we're not gonna talk about all of these, but uh, here's an example of a testosterone. This is a male sex hormone and estrogen. And you can see that these are very similar. This is the female uh, sex hormone and the molecules look very similar, but there are some important differences. And an enzyme, a protein called aromatase actually converts testosterone to uh, estrogen. For one thing, there's a carbonyl at the one end of the testosterone, which becomes an estrogen, uh, becomes a hydroxyl and estrogen. The other is that there are less double bonds around here in the testosterone, so it's bent over here, and it's flat on the left-hand side in the estrogen. And the third difference is there's a methyl group uh, in testosterone, as you can see. The methyl group is a CH3. So there are very subtle differences make in the molecules make a totally big difference in 
obviously uh, gender characteristics and determination of sex. So uh, water is a very important molecule in organic chemistry. It will be a very important mo molecule in bioelectromagnetics because water is about 70% of the living organism. Uh, so here's a water molecule. It's an oxygen and two hydrogens. And these uh, oxygen and hydrogen, as you know, have a differing electronegativity. And different electronegativity means a different attraction for electrons. Namely, oxygen is more electronegative, attracts electrons more than hydrogen, which is less electronegative. And therefore, you have a slight distribution of charge in this molecule with more negative charge on the oxygen, less uh, on the hydrogen. Uh, and that distribution of negative charges and positive charges allow for interaction electrostatically among them to form what are called hydrogen bonds. And you can see these hydrogen bonds forming and reforming in water, uh, uh, liquid water. And of course, these hydrogen bonds are also responsible for the structure of solid water, which is ice. Another very important concept in the fundamental biochemistry is that of the difference between hydrophobic, which is water hating, versus hydrophilic, which is water loving. So this is a hydrophobic molecule, the blue one. Obviously, these are water molecules around it with oxygen and hydrogen. Uh, hydrophobic means it doesn't want to be with water, and you can see that these blue molecules are coming together. So an example of a molecule that is both hydrophobic and hydrophilic is what we call an amphiphilic molecule. An amphiphilic molecule has a water-hating part, hydrophobic, and a water-friendly uh, or water-loving part, which is hydrophobic. And those steroid molecules that we saw, uh, which are the basis of the testosterone and the estrogen that we saw, have this characteristic of being amphiphilic. So here is the hydrophobic section, and the hydrophilic section is more charges or more polar groups, such as the hydroxyls, the carboxyl groups that we saw. Another example of an amphiphilic molecule is a fatty acid. And uh, this is uh, a hydrophobic region, and this is the hydrophilic region of uh, the fatty acid. Another very fundamental concept in uh, biology is that of polymerization and depolymerization. So biological molecules are very large and complex, but they are not, of course, randomly put together. They are built from uh, a smaller number of simpler parts we call monomers. And those monomers go together to form large macromolecules. And they come together in the, in the reaction called polymerization, and they come apart in the reaction called depolymerization. So polymerization, you have these monomers, individual groups. So for example, amino acid or a monosaccharide or a nucleotide in uh, proteins, carbohydrates, nucleic acid respectively. And that monomer comes in with a short polymer uh, water comes out and they come together to form a longer polymer. This we call polymerization, also known as condensation. And then the opposite, also known as hydro hydrolysis, is the depolymerization. Here you have a polymer with four units and eventually it becomes three units and one of the monomers is lost in depolymerization. So now we have the four types of, we finished the fundamentals, let's focus on carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are molecules that have this uh, form, uh, carbon and hydrate, carbohydrates. So we have uh, some terminology. Uh, we have five carbon carbohydrates. These are called pentose sugars, six carbon carbohydrates, hexose sugars. There are also more rarely three and four carbon sugars in biology, but these are the major ones. Uh, glucose here is what we call an aldose because it has an aldehyde at the end, but most of the others are hydroxyl groups. And a ketose, this is an example of fructose. And this is the way this glucose in a linear form comes and looks in a ring form where this molecule wraps up on itself, which we'll talk about uh, shortly. So here is this straight form, and this is the ring form of the glucose. It can be in two forms, alpha or beta, uh, 
and depending on how they link up to form the polysaccharide, as we mentioned, the polymerization, they will form either starch, which is a straight chain, or cellulose, uh, uh, cellulose which is a straight chain, or starch, which is uh, a helix. So this straight chain cellulose is what we see in wood. Uh, it's not digestible by humans. It's very dense. Uh, and that's what gives wood its strength. And we also have starch, which is what we see in rice and wheat and bread, which is in a helical form. Another important molecule are lipids. And lipids are combinations of fatty acids, uh, which come together with glycerol to form fats or triglycerides. As I mentioned, they are amphiphilic. They have a hydrophobic side as well as a hydrophilic side. The hydrophobic side is characterized by just carbon and hydrogen. The hydrophilic side has these functional groups that we described. And through polymerization, dehydration synthesis, we get uh, a uh, triglyceride, tri meaning one, two, three, and glycerin here. Uh, as I mentioned, these fatty acids are and triglycerides are amphiphilic. They have a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic side, uh, but we can make it even more amphiphilic by increasing the charge on the hydrophilic portion. And we call these phospholipids. We attach a phosphate. Remember I told you there was a lot of negative charge there. We may attach a choline. So this is phosphatidylcholine. It is hydri highly hy hy amphiphilic, and it has this hydrophilic head and this hydrophilic, hydrophobic tail. So the important concept is that these amphiphilic molecules, highly amphiphilic, can come together spontaneously to form structures that become biologically relevant. So you can form a micelle, or you can form phospholipid bilayers, and this is the basis of the membrane that we see that surrounds cells, the plasma membrane. So this is the uh, lipids that we saw, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, we see the proteins also, membrane proteins, embedded uh, in this membrane. And this is what gives the cell the structural integrity, the difference between the inside and the outside. So now we shift to proteins, some representative proteins. Uh, proteins are long chains of amino acids. They are many of them, thousands of them in the body. Uh, this is myoglobin. It's a uh, oxygen uh, storage protein. This is a basic fibroblast growth factor. It's a growth factor. This is mostly alpha helix. This is mostly beta strand. We have human growth hormone. These are what we call ribbon diagrams. And this is a, a Van der Waals surface diagram. Uh, and then we also have androgen receptor, also a predominantly alpha helical protein. So what are the functions of these proteins? They have structural proteins, storage proteins, uh, transport proteins, hormonal proteins, receptor proteins, such as the ones we saw, contractile proteins that are related to movement, defensive proteins like antibodies, and of course, enzymes, which catalyze reactions. So here's an example of a transport protein. This is a voltage-dependent potassium channel. You can see that uh, uh, if there's a voltage across the membrane, so this is a membrane protein, the protein will change shape and the channel will change shape, allowing potassium to come in. You can see it's closed off here and now it's open. So this would be the closed state and this will be the open state. The reason I show this diagram is it uh, suggests very strongly how these proteins are like nanomachines. It also points out this is a voltage dependent potassium channel. In other words, it is sensitive to electric changes. So bioelectromagnetics will is already evident in these uh, structural changes. We will be talking about this channel a lot over the coming days or coming lectures. So as I mentioned, proteins are polymers. They're polymers of amino acids, which are the monomers. The amino acid basic structure has an amino group, a carboxyl acid group, and then a side chain of which there are 20 of them. This backbone is regular, and as I mentioned, the side chains are variable. So the protein has this backbone. Uh, we saw in the ribbon diagram, and coming off are all these different possible side chains. So there are 20 amino acids defined by these 20 side, side chains. Uh, 
uh, we can describe the hydrophobic ones versus the hydrophilic ones. We can describe the charged ones versus the polar ones. And we can describe the positively charged ones versus the negatively charged ones. And these are all 20. Nonpolar, polar, charged, positively charged, and negatively charged. So what is the peptide bond? The peptide bond is the connection between these two uh, molecules. So you can see here a condensation reaction, the polymerization we talked about, between the carboxylic acid on one side and the amino group on the other side to form a peptide bond, as we can see here. This peptide bond has a unique properties of being both rigid and flexible around it. And this flexibility is manifest in these, this is the uh, peptide bond of uh, one set and the other one. Around this peptide bond, you have a single bond that can rotate. We call them phi psi angles. So this chain can move around and adopt a three-dimensional shape. So this three-dimensional shape can uh, result in two types of secondary structure, what we call the alpha helix, which you can see here, or the beta strand, which you can see up here in the ribbon diagram. So the levels of protein structure are the primary structure, which is the amino acid sequence. The secondary structure, which we just described, uh, is of those two varieties. The tertiary structure is the folding in three dimensions, and the quaternary structure is the folding together of different subunits of proteins. A last concept in proteins is the concept of protein dynamics. This is very important. These proteins are not solid, rigid, uh, molecules, they're actually vibrating, as you can see here. This is a molecular dynamic simulation of a protein. Uh, and uh, Martin Karplus, my professor, when I was in college, was one of the founders or pioneers in this concept of protein dynamics. And he told me, uh, proteins are neither solids nor liquids, they are something in between. Uh, he got the Nobel Prize in 2013, and this is myself and Professor Karplus at the uh, celebration symposium in San Francisco in 2014. So one important function of proteins is in enzymes. Uh, an enzyme uh, catalyzes a reaction uh, from a reactant to a product and it follows a basic sequence where you have the protein and the substrate comes in. In this case this is a sucrose and the enzyme is a sucrase. The substrate binds to the enzyme the substrate is uh, converted to the products, in this case, fructose and glucose. And finally, the products are released and the enzyme or catalyst is regenerated. And this is a uh, depiction of that, the enzyme substrate complex, the products are released. So here's a substrate, enzyme substrate complex, and as you can see, products being released. The key point is that the enzyme as a catalyst is regenerated, not consumed. So one of the basic concepts, very important concept in biology is the concept of feedback or negative inhibition. It's a common regulatory mechanism in biology and negative feedback systems are by nature, by mathematics, stable systems. So here you have an example of an enzyme producing many, uh, or, or a sequence of enzymes producing some product from A to G. And you might have a key step here, we call that the first committed set step, where the product will inhibit the amount of activity of going from C to D. Why is that important? We call that negative feedback, because if there's too much product, it will negatively feedback and reduce the amount of product being produced. So we end up with a stable amount of product. So more product, less activity, but less product, more activity, tends to maintain the system at a steady state. We have two types of enzyme inhibition. One type is competitive inhibition, where the inhibitor binds at the same site as the substrate. The other one is non-competitive inhibition, where the enzyme binds uh, in a region away from the substrate. Uh, now moving to nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are composed of uh, two basic types, or are two basic types, phosphoanhydrides and phosphodiesters. The phosphoanhydrides are common in ATP and other high energy compounds. We'll talk about that shortly. And phosphodiesters are the backbone of DNA and RNA. So you can see phosphoanhydrides here. You can see uh, the charges and then phosphodiesters 
look uh, like this, and they're in the DNA RNA backbone. Of course, the uh, nuclear, uh, nucleic acids are famous for the double helix. This is Watson and Crick showing the double helix, as you can see here. This is that backbone. We talked about phosphodiesters, and we'll talk quickly about the interior part of this di uh, double helix, which are the nucleus side bases. So the hydrogen bonding in this uh, double helix, this is the backbone, which is the phosphodiester, and we have these nucleoside bases, which are interacting with each other by hydrogen bonds, much like the hydrogen bonds we saw in water. So a thymine, there are four types of bases, thymine, adenine, and guanosine, and cytosine, and they will uh, lock together with two or three hydrogen bonds, respectively, keeping the double helical uh, diameter roughly constant, and uh, you'll see this uh, uh, hydrogen bonded sequence or uh, ladder of different nucleotide bases, and that comprises the genetic material. So that genetic material in humans, of course, is DNA in a double helix, and you can see these nucleoside bases. That DNA will be replicated uh, by a process called DNA replication, which will also involve some processes of repair and recombination. The DNA is also transcribed uh, to RNA, and that RNA message is single-stranded, which is then translated to actual proteins. Uh, this is the central dogma, a reverse transcription, which is not in the original central dogma, found in retroviruses like HIV, uh, go in the opposite direction for RNA to DNA. So this is a little depiction of this. You can see uh, the genome, the chromosomes, the DNA, uh, ultimately producing uh, RNA, and those RNA will produce uh, proteins. This is the central dogma, as we described. So this DNA in the, in the nucleus is not just as DNA, but typically in combination with proteins, and we call this chromatin. So the chromatin is a DNA plus protein complex. The specific name of these proteins are histones. And you can see that they are wrapped around, the DNA double helix is wrapped around these eight histones. We call this uh, nucleo uh, histone octamer. And this chromatin is involved in both the packaging and the regulation of the DNA, organized in a hierarchical fashion with successive DNA packing arrangements. So these are these octamers, they're wrapped uh, around even more, and you can get very tight packing of the DNA in an organized way. So uh, there are two types of cells, uh, essentially. There are prokaryotes and eukaryotes. The prokaryotes, which are found in uh, bacteria, will uh, don't have a nucleus, and the DNA goes directly to the RNA, which then goes to produce via translation the proteins. It's a little more complex in the eukaryotic cell. That DNA is in a nucleus. You get RNA, but that RNA is a precursor RNA which ultimately then goes outside of the nucleus to produce the protein as we described on the ribosome. So basic biochemistry is quite complicated. We're not going to go into the details of it, but basically you start with glucose and you have a process of glycolysis. You get pyruvate, acetyl-CoA, and ultimately carbon dioxide. Uh, and that carbon dioxide can be used for catabolism uh, to break down carbohydrates, fats, and proteins ultimately to carbon dioxide. Uh, we can also do the opposite, go from uh, sugars and uh, other uh, compounds to then produce sugars, uh, RNA and DNA, phospholipids, and fats. So this is the breakdown of molecules. This is the uh, buildup of molecules. And glucose is a, plays a very central role. Uh, as we mentioned, the phospho... Uh, uh, the phosphoanhydrides are involved uh, high energy compounds, and that's ATP. And that ATP is a high energy compound that we'll talk about in a little more detail that can be coupled to other biological work, such as transport work to uh, transport molecules against their concentration gradient, to do mechanical work to move things like the muscles or move along a microtubule as well as, of course, chemical work to do, uh, to perform reactions that would be otherwise not favorable uh, to supply the energy to do that. And that's because these processes, such as transport work, mechanical work, and chemical work, are 
we say coupled, hence energy coupling, to the hydrolysis of ATP. So now let's talk about cells and tissues. Some quick background. So the eukaryotic cell uh, has many parts to it. We've already talked about some of them. Very important part is the plasma membrane composed of lipids that we described, the amphiphilic molecules. That plasma membrane is responsible for the cell integrity. By cell integrity, we mean the outside and the inside of the cell. It's obviously the barrier between them. Now that barrier is not 100%. There is the capability to transport information. Uh, in other words, the cell can recognize what's outside the cell. So that's a form of information, as well as there are some forms of matter transport. How is that membrane synthesized? It's synthesized of those lipids come together in what's called a smooth endoplasmic reticulum inside the cell, and the function of that is membrane synthesis. Where is the genetic material? As we mentioned, it's in the nucleus. And what do the ribosomes do? The ribosomes are where the RNA translates to proteins, brings protein monomers together, amino acids to produce proteins. And the free ribosomes are involved in intracellular protein synthesis. And the ribosomes that are associated with the membranes uh, specifically called the rough endoplasmic reticulum, so it's similar to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, are involved in the uh, extracellular or membrane proteins. And the Golgi apparatus is for protein export, whereas the lysosomes are for protein import. So you might have heard about uh, hydroxychloroquine and COVID-19 and all these sorts of things. Well, COVID-19 uh, infects the nuclei, uh, binds to the plasma membrane, is internalized in these lysosomes, and then can produce RNA and more uh, viruses uh, via these ribosomes uh, on inside the cell. So the virus hijacks multiple components inside the cell to replicate. And finally, we have the mitochondria, which are involved in energy production or the production of ATP. So obviously cells and tissues, we look at them under the microscope and there are several histologic stains. Uh, these histologic stains, uh, the two major types, the hematoxylin and eosin stain. Basically this is involved in staining the nuclei as opposed to the outside of the cells. So it's very good at determining the structure of tissues. Another important stain uh, is the right stain that it was used for that is used for blood cells. So we have many representative tissues uh, in the body. We have bone, cartilage, adipose, skin, intestine, neural tissue, cardiac muscle, skeletal muscle. So there are many types of tissues, but ultimately there are only four basic tissue types. Those four basic tissue types are derived from the ectoderm and endoderm in embryology or the mesoderm. And the four are epithelial, neural, in the case of ectoderm and endoderm, and connective tissue and muscle in the case of mesoderm. So all the organs in the body, all those representative tissues that we saw before, uh, are ultimately broken down into four types of tissues, which are epithelial, neural, connective, and muscle. We're going to talk about each of those in turn. So the first one is the epithelial cells and tissues. These are many different types, each reflecting adaptation to uh, different requirements and basically the structure determines the function. So we have absorptive epithelia that uh, uh, have uh, many microvilli for absorption. We have simple epithelia, very thin, typically for gas exchange or in, in the capillaries. We have secretory epithelium which are for many Golgi apparatus for secreting hormones or other proteins and we have stratified epithelium for protective purposes such as, of course, the skin. The second type of cell type is the, the tissue type is the neural cells. And there are two types of neural cells, neurons and glial cells. Neurons are the basic unit of structure and function of the nervous system. Their most notable quality is that of irritability, namely the ability to produce electrical signals in response to an external stimulus or in response to other cells. The glial cells, the second type of cell, generally serve supporting functions. So let's look at a typical neuron. Uh, it has two parts, the body or soma and the axon. And the body is where the local impulses arrive 
and uh, the axon is where the action potentials uh, are uh, sent. So local potential and action potential. These are electrical signals. The local potential is a small signal. The action potential is a big signal, and we will talk about these very shortly. So uh, we're starting to talk about a little bit of electromagnetism now. The, the membrane of all cells has a resting potential around it. Uh, that resting potential is slightly negative on the inside. So you see inside here and outside, and this is the negative on the inside. So why does that happen? That's because all cells have a sodium potassium gradient with high potassium inside and high sodium outside. That's generated by the ATP in the cell and the transporters, the transport work that we talked about. High sodium outside, high potassium inside. In their resting state, the cell membranes are permeable to potassium. So because there's high potassium on the inside, it wants to flow out to equilibrate laws of thermodynamics. So some of that potassium will flow out. And if some of the potassium flows back out and the sodium is not allowed to go in, there'll be an excess negative charge that builds up. And we call that an electrochemical gradient. The resting potential is generated. So what is an action potential? This is the resting potential of minus 75 millivolts. If we have a small voltage change, we call a local potential, there's a threshold that suddenly involves a action potential, a sudden shift from negative to positive. And that is going to occur through the shift in those proteins in the membrane between potassium conductance and sodium conductance. This is the action potential uh, schematically, the threshold, negative resting potentials shift to positive, then back down again and slowly to the resting potential. So another important concept is that nerve cells communicate via the synapse. So information is transmitted from one neuron to the other. This is the presynaptic neuron and this is the postsynaptic neuron. So there's a gap between them. The presynaptic has this action potential, the big change that we described, and the postsynaptic can have either a local potential, another action potential, or some biochemical changes. And biochemical changes underlie learning, as we will see. So you have electrical synapses and chemical synapse, and the chemical synapse involves a little bit of uh, vesicles that have the transmitter, so you have the action potential, the, the transmitter is released, uh, it diffuses and binds to receptor on the postsynaptic membrane, and then you have various actions as well as an off signal. So let's look at that happen here. You have a negative here, resting potential becomes uh, on the left-hand side, the presynaptic cell, it becomes positive, and then that causes the release of the transmitter, receptor binding, then you have a change in the postsynaptic cell and then the elimination or off signal of the transmitter. So the third type of cell are muscle cells and the three basic muscle types, skeletal, smooth, and cardiac. Uh, they have different properties, uh, different proteins, different uh, speed of action. Uh, skeletal muscle is linear, smooth muscle is fairly nonlinear, and heart muscle or cardiac muscle is a mix of those two geometries and types. So the sarcomere is the basic mechanism of contraction. The sarcomere is the component in the muscle cell and the contraction is mediated by what we call successive actin-myosin interactions. So actin and myosin are major proteins in the muscle. Uh, this is the sarcomere structure and you have what are called ultimately thin filaments and thick filaments. The thick filaments will be myosin and the thin filaments will be actin. And the essential process of contraction is when the actin, thin filaments, and the thick filaments will slide on each other in an interaction that's controlled by ATP. Uh, you can see that here in the schematic. You can see the thick filament myosin, the thin filament actin, and uh, pulling each other together to form the contraction of the muscle. The fourth and last tissue type are connective tissue cells. These are derived from fibroblasts. And what's interesting about connective tissue cells is that the material around the cell, the matrix, generally determines the properties of the cell. So here are some examples of connective tissue cells. These are the fibroblasts. This is the elastin and the collagen, which is the matrix around it. Fat cells are an example of connective tissue. Bone is also 
an example of connective tissue cells. In this case, the matrix, the material around that is the calcium phosphate, which gives bone its hardness. So the extracellular matrix around the cells is very important. It determines the properties of the connective tissue. And we have two components to the extracellular matrix. We have a ground substance, which is semi-fluid gel, not flexible, heavily hydrated. This is like a mucus. Then we have the fibers, which are collagen of various types, elastin, fibronectin, laminin. And this is an example of that. We have the ground substance, which is this gel-like material, and the fibers as we described here. Uh, one example of this is a bone biology. You have static properties of the bone. You have collagen fibers. You have an inorganic matrix. We call this a fiber composite. Collagen is a protein. The inorganic matrix is calcium phosphate, uh, calcium hydroxyapatite. And the composites are materials that have uh, additional properties beyond their capabilities. So this is the bone. Uh, you can see uh, more and more fibers. You see the uh, collagen, uh, collagen and hydroxyapatite. The green here is the uh, protein, and the red here is the hydroxyapatite. So this is a fiber composite. Uh, fiber composites have superior properties, and there's special properties of collagen. So that's the static properties of bone. You also have dynamic properties. The so bone can be formed through osteoblasts, and the bo bone can also be uh, broken down by osteoclasts. So the bone has a basic dynamic properties that it's being formed and resorbed constantly. Why is this important? We, we're gonna talk a little bit about electromagnetics. Uh, one way that bones are healing is in response to stresses that alter this balance in the bone formation and the bone resorption. And it has been shown that uh, directed electromagnetic fields can help with that healing. And that is one component for uh, bone healing and fractures and so forth. So now let's talk about some basic physiology and we will be almost finished uh, with the lecture. I wanna talk about two basic concepts in physiology that are important. One is the stress response. And when I mean stress response, I don't just mean stress, psychological stress, which is important but a very specific physiological stress response. Uh, and the second thing I wanna talk about is the cell membrane physiology. So the stress response involves stress hormones, which we will talk about shortly. Uh, and there are various responses that occur. So for example, the breathing rate increases, the heart rate increases, the blood sugar increases, the blood pressure increases, the pupils dilate, the intestinal muscles relax, and we have more blood flow to the skeletal muscles in the arms and legs. These are typical stress responses. And we have two autonomic nervous systems. Uh, that uh, We have the conscious nervous system. We also have the unconscious or autonomic nervous system. The two types are the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. The sympathetic nervous system mediates responses to stress. It is a generalized system around the whole body and it involves adrenaline. So you've probably heard of adrenaline. Another name for it is epinephrine. Then we have the parasympathetic nervous system, uh, which involves in a resting state is usually more local and doesn't involve adrenaline, but rather another molecule called acetylcholine. And this is a little bit complex diagram, but uh, the details are not critical, but you have the sympathetic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system, and they affect all throughout the body for the stress response or the, or the non-stress response. One interesting one I wanna focus on is the heart. You see a lot of uh, connections to the heart. So when you're stressed, your heart rate increases, your uh, contractility increases. If it's a really a lot of stress, you can actually feel, uh, sense your heart beating. Uh, the heart also has input from the parasympathetic nervous system, which lowers the rate, lowers the contractility. So the stress response both involves a uh, neurological part, which is related to the sympathomedullary pathway, as well as a hormonal part, which is the pituitary adrenaline system. So this is with adrenaline, and this is with the corticosteroids, or stress hormones, the long term. So the left-hand side is short-term and the right-hand side is 
long-term. So stress response is both short-term and long-term. One important concept in biology is that of homeostasis. Homeostasis says that things stay constant. So for example, the blood glucose level, the amount of sugar in the blood stays roughly constant. If it's too high, excuse me, uh, you will get uh, the beta cells of the pancreas to secrete insulin. Insulin will then absorb the glucose from the bloodstream, put it into the, to the liver, and then the blood glucose goes down. That's an example of the negative feedback we saw. If the blood glucose is too low, then the alpha cells of the pancreas will secrete glucagon, which will do the opposite and release glucose from the liver. And then thus the blood glucose level will go up. So this homeostasis, as originally developed by the French physiologist in the 19th century, Claude Bernard, has been a very important concept and is related to the mathematical concept of control theory and negative feedback and stable systems. But another way to think of it is what I call uh, real, or what is called rheostasis. Rheostasis means the body itself is not a set system, but alters between states so that it keeps things on a looking the same, but in fact, the body alters between states. So for example, between the stress state and the relaxed state. We see that, for example, with insulin. We have the fed state versus the fasting state. In the fed state, after a meal, after uh, lunch, you have basically uh, glucose coming from the gut. And in the fasted state, you have glucose coming from the liver. Uh, in the fasted state, that's a state of low insulin. In low insulin, you're bringing glucose back from the body. In the fed state, you have a high insulin and you're getting glucose from you know, your input. So as I said, the membrane around the cell, which is responsible for the cell integrity, is also uh, able to transmit information. Uh, that information we call signal transduction. And one mechanism of information transport is via what are called G-protein link receptors. So this is the membrane, this is the receptor, and this is the G-protein. A molecule binds from the outside. That's the information. We have to uh, signal that information to the inside. So the molecule binds to the receptor, it changes structure, binds to a G-protein, G protein uh, gets uh, turned to GTP, then other actions can ensue. So this G protein is the signal transduction molecule from the outside to do changes on the inside. Very important concept. So these G proteins are involved, for example, in smelling. So these are different mammals, worms, insects. They have different odorant receptors. Uh, some of them have G proteins that uh, create the electrical change in response to smell or in response to detecting a smelly molecule and odorant on the outside, it will create a signal. In addition to matter transport across the membrane, we can, in addition to information transport across the membrane, we can also have matter transport across the membrane. We call this endocytosis. And there are three types of endocytosis. There's phagocytosis, where a whole solid particle is taken up by the membrane and internalized in a phagosome. We have pinocytosis, where small amounts of the fluid is taken in into the cytoplasm. And we have finally receptor-mediated endocytosis, where there's a specific receptor, pulls it in uh, into what's called a coated vesicle. So I'll give a closing thought here. Uh, Richard Dawkins, a uh, famous evolutionary uh, biologist, uh, explaining what is uh, life in a way. A biology is the study of complex things in the universe. Physics is the study of the simple ones. Bioelectromagnetics is very exciting because we will do both of them. We will see simple things. Of course, physics is not simple, but if we can have simple systems, an electromagnetic wave interacting with a very complex system, which is obviously biology. So I hope I gave you a little flavor of biology in the last uh, hour or so. Uh, of this complexity, some of the key concepts from the molecules to the cells, to the tissues, to the physiology. But I like this quote a lot. Biology is the study of the complex things in the universe. Physics is the study of the simple ones. So uh, we have uh, finished basic concepts in biology.
next week we are now going to we are now prepared with these basic concepts in electromagnetism basic concepts in biology we're now prepared to make rapid progress understanding basic electromagnetic processes in biology we will start with molecules such as those ion channels then to cells and tissues and then to whole organisms uh, so next week we will start to talk about that and of course, in the second half of the course, we're going to talk about applications of uh, bioelectromagnetism. So uh, that uh, finishes uh, uh, this lecture. The question for next week, which was actually, you already did that, is why is the sky blue? Uh, I will answer this very quickly. Most of you answered the sky is blue because of the scattering of radiation around the uh, from the light rays and blue light is scattered more than red light. That is the conventional physics uh, explanation. That is correct. But if you think about it, why is the sky blue? Because actually there's also scattering of ultraviolet light. Uh, and then there's also infrared light. And all of this light, our eyes do not see these other radiation. We do not see, uh, we can feel heat radiating from the sun. Uh, but we don't see ultraviolet light. So one of the reasons why the sky is blue because our eyes can see blue. And the point of my answer is, it's not just a matter of the physics is why the sky is blue. It's also a matter of the biology. Uh, and that's the correct answer. Uh, I will stop for now. And uh, uh, we have time for some questions. And then uh, we will... Uh, meet again next week. I really appreciate your time and I want you all to take uh, very good care during this uh, difficult time.